So we're going to look at some of the intermolecular attractions that are possible. So here's two molecules of carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide molecules are nonpolar molecules. You have a dipole here, a dipole here, but because the bond angles are 180 degrees and these are exactly counteracting to each other, there is no net dipole. So by itself, it's a nonpolar molecule. That's why carbon dioxide is a gas. But with London's attractions, uh, which we're gonna look at, these are extremely weak. It happens only during a collision uh, that creates a temporary dipole. And the only attractive force possible for nonpolar molecules. So let's just try to demonstrate this. It's not gonna be very good, but you're used to that. Here's, oops, here's the nucleus, here's the electron cloud. The electron cloud is symmetrical, so it seems to be a nonpolar molecule. Here's another one over here. I'm gonna put them close to each other. And then, during the collision, electron clouds deform. So if I push this one over here, I see that there's a partial positive excuse me, partial negative charge over here because the electron cloud is being pushed over here and a partial negative, I'm sorry, getting them all mixed up, partial negative, partial positive on this side because it's closer to the nucleus. So you see this partial negative cloud over here is attracted to that partial positive section of the other one. But this only happens during a collision. As the collision, as the electrons bounce apart, they go back to being symmetrical again, just like nothing happened. In fact, it's not like one just wins, the other one loses. This thing goes back and forth like this. It just oscillate back and forth. And during that point of collision, where you have these oscillations, uh, there's a net resulting attractive force, which is why you can actually get two molecules of carbon dioxide if you push them close enough together by lowering the temperature, increasing the pressure. You can liquefy carbon dioxide. Then the attractive forces that are holding it together are simply London's attractions. They're colliding with each other. You can also solidify carbon dioxide. So anyway, let's just look at different ways to look at the um, types of intermolecular attractions. So again, here's two nonpolar molecules. Right now, they're nonpolar, there is no dipole. But what happens again when they collide? They deform each other's electron clouds, creating a temporary dipole. Anyway, what if you have a molecule that has a dipole in it? For example, hydrogen chloride. So hydrogen chloride has a difference in electronegativity, putting that bond in the category of being a polar covalent bond. So there is a permanent dipole indicated by the partial charges. So two things are possible when two of these particles come close together. This would be attraction. The other possibility would be repulsion. But as we've talked about, uh, Repulsion is not anywhere near as important as attraction. If I take a box and I put a bunch of magnets in there and I shake the box up, I throw it across the room, then I go look to see what's happening inside the box, I'll find that the magnets are all clumped together. They're not all dispersed because of repulsive forces, they're clumped together because of the attractive forces. Not that attractive forces are stronger, they just predominate. So this would be a repulsive force. So that would cause these molecules to change their orientation and become attractions. So here's a dipole to another dipole attraction. So this is a dipole-dipole attraction. So here's two water molecules. And then we learned in the previous chapters that Water is a bent molecule, uh, has two polar covalent bonds that are 109 and a half degrees to each other approximately. 
and so they don't cancel out. And so if this is the dipole right here, electrons are being pulled towards the hydrogen, excuse me, electrons are being pulled away from the hydrogen, causing a partial positive charge over there, and then towards the oxygen. Now it doesn't make sense for me to put a negative charge right there because that's where we you know, assume that the, the uh, nucleus is. So I put it out here on this non-binding electron pair. So we see we have four points that have charges on it. So now when another water molecule comes by, this would be repulsive force. So that would reorientate itself so we get an attractive force. And the attractive force is strongest when it's just exactly opposite like this, this would be a weaker attraction. So this would be what would, happening, what would happen in a very cold environment where there's not very much kinetic energy and molecular motion is minimal. So why do we call this a hydrogen bond? Because the criteria to be a hydrogen bond is that you first have to have a dipole and a dipole. They have to be polar molecules. And then you need to have a large partial negative. And how you get that was the th is with the three most electronegative elements on the periodic table, excluding chlorine, which we talked about in the chapter. So those are F, O, and N. So in other words, <clears throat> this right here qualifies because that's an O and it's an A polar molecule. So what about the other molecule? The other molecule has to supply a large partial positive charge. And how we get that is with an FH, an OH, or an NH, because this gives a large dipole right here. And hydrogen is unique, because if I start pulling this one valence electron away from it, there is nothing else to shield the nucleus over here. Any other element, if I take away an outer electron, I'm going to have inner electrons to shield the nucleus. So this is how we get our large partial positive. So now does this meet the criteria for being a hydrogen bond? Here's the OH in one. What do I need in the other? It has to be polar and it has to have an F, an O, or an N. This one has that. So this is a hydrogen bond. So both entities have to have one form of fun. What about ammonia? So ammonia is pyramidal. The bond angles again are about 109 and a half. It's a polar molecule because of the strong electronegativity between hydrogen and nitrogen. So right now this would be a repulsive force. So this repulsive force would cause one of these to reorientate. So maybe something like this, that would still be repulsive. Something like this, that would be attractive. And it would mi maximize the attractions by going like this. Now, is this a hydrogen bond? Well, let's think about all the attractions possible between that water molecule and that ammonia molecule. Does it have London's attractions? Yes. Everything has that during a collision. Does it have dipole to dipole attractions? Yes. Here's a dipole. Here's another dipole. Does it meet the special criteria to be a strong dipole attraction called the hydrogen bond? So here's the OH of one. What do I need in the other one? An F, an O, or an N. There's the N. So yes, it does meet that criteria. So here's a question. Does ammonia dissolve in water? And the answer is yes. Ammonia is strongly attracted to water because they both have dipoles and they can form hydrogen bonds, which is a strong attractive force. So let's think about a few other things. Here's two water molecules. Uh, they're attracted to each other. This is going to be at a colder temperature because of kinetic theory. They have uh, lower velocity, so they might be vibrating in place, but they're still being held there. 
Now what happens if I increase the temperature? So these vibrations become more and more violent until eventually they're not even attracted to each other. So if they're not attracted to each other, then that means they're going to be in the, in the vapor phase. So in liquid water, there's about two hydrogen bonds for every water molecule. In solid water, called ice, there's four. So we get another water molecule here, here, and here to complete the four. Notice that if there was another water molecule here, there would be basically a hole right here. So what's in that hole? Nothing. And now we can explain really why ice floats on water. Because if you take liquid water with two hydrogen bonds per molecule and you freeze it, so you end up having four hydrogen bonds per molecule, these things leave a hole right here because the vibrating in place can't come inside here. It has to end up over in there, leaving that hole right there. So if you think about um, the density, density is the mass per volume. Okay, so what happens if I increase the volume because of forming these holes right here? Then what happens to the density? The density goes down. That's why solid ice will float on liquid water. And then the fourth one is ion to dipole. So here's a dipole. Here's an ion. Here's another ion. Will the chloride ion be, an attract, will be attracted to water? That would be a repulsive force. That would be an attractive force. So the answer is yes. That's going to be strongly attracted to water because this is not a partial charge. This is a full charge. This has one electron more than it does protons. So this type of attraction is going to be stronger. What about the sodium ion? There's another attraction right there. So yes, there's an ion to dipole charge with the sodium and also with the chloride. So does sodium chloride dissolve in water? The answer is yes, because you're forming ion to dipole attractions, which are very strong. If I put the two ions together, then that is not an intermolecular attraction. That is an intramolecular attraction, also known as a bond. So this ionic bond is actually quite strong. It takes 801 degrees to basically separate these from one another. But you can put it in water at just pretty much any temperature, and this is what water would do. Comes in here, forms these strong attractions right here. So there's so many water molecules that sodium chloride dissolves in water because the attraction between sodium and water and chloride and water are in effect stronger than the attractions between sodium and chloride itself. So those are the four types. What if we have this? I'll take away the chloride and I put this in here. This is the carbonate ion, it's a polyatomic ion. It has two electrons more than it does protons, so it's an ion. So I'm not locating that negative two charge in any particular atom, I don't have to. All I know is that this entity right here is negative two charge. It's gonna be attracted to that partial positive charge. So again, this is an ion to dipole attraction and it's strong. And of course this would be an ionic bond. So what if I have a nonpolar molecule and a polar molecule? What is the strongest possible attraction between these two molecules? So if they collide, they will experience London's attractions because they would deform each other's electron clouds. Does it meet the criteria before it to be a dipole-dipole? Here's a dipole, but there's no dipole over here because this is a nonpolar molecule. So the only attraction possible between a nonpolar molecule and a polar molecule is London's attractions. What about this? 
here's an ion, and here's a nonpolar molecule. Um, does CO2 dissolve in sodium like sodium chloride? The answer is no. But do they attract to each other when they collide? Yes, they do. All particles will experience London's attraction. So that is the strongest attraction between an ion and a nonpolar molecule. So what if I have carbon dioxide in water? So here's an interesting question. Does carbon dioxide dissolve in water? Another way to ask that is are they attracted to each other? The answer is yes, but only very, very weakly because of London's attractions. But everybody believes that carbon dioxide dissolves in water. Well, here's the reason why. Carbon dioxide in water will react in a chemical reaction to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid then can ionize to form hydrogen ion and the bicarbonate ion. So is it the CO2 that dissolves in water? No, it's the carbonic acid because carbonic acid is a polar molecule. It's also an acid because we have the hydrogens in front. If you take one off, now you form ions. So these ions right here are extremely soluble in water because of ion to dipole attractions. Carbon, excuse me, um, carbonic acid itself is very soluble in water because of hydrogen bonding. But if you talked about CO2 and water itself, no, they're not really attracted to each other. It's only because of London's attractions, which is very, very weak.